ministry is, what it should look like, what it is maybe going on in your local church, what it isn't. My goal today is to just cast a vision and really allow our time together today to be a springboard for all of you. Because the bottom line is we all are in various circles, whether it's a local church we're trying to do a wraparound or trying to start something ourselves. Some of us are involved in churches. We hear this all the time. I just wish our leadership would get on board, and they're not, and then they're discouraged because they feel like they can't start something. Let me just say, I don't know what your situation is, but I want to take a little bit of time to allow you all, so I get to know each one of you and where you're coming from. Don't let that stop you, okay? If, if you are in a situation where the leadership is saying, you know, no, there's, there's probably a reason. They're not bad old people that don't want an orphan ministry going on. They're just bombarded and swamped. And really what happened in our church, you have heard my husband share his story that, you know, he was a pastor for 18 years. We knew it. It was a part of our lives. But we just didn't preach it and teach it. And so oftentimes we hear in the adoption and foster care realm, um, we need to recruit. Let me change your thinking. What if we said we need to disciple? And what does discipleship look like? How does discipleship look different than recruitment? Throw something out there at me. Teaching. Teaching. Does it happen instantaneously? It's going to be a long road. Okay, so um, let's just start up front with Colleen. Tell us, tell me who you are, where you're from, and why you're here today. What are you hoping to glean from this?
adoption is thought of differently there, so I don't know how to be a spark. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Here. Hey, uh, I'm, my name is Michalia King, and I am an adopted individual, so um, yeah, the Lord's just revealed that I need to start telling my story more and mm -hmm. learning. and. Mm -hmm. Love it, you guys. Hi, I'm Brian Rumsch. I'm from Hopkins, and I'm part of a new nonprofit organization that's All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Allison Penaran, uh, and I am vice president of that organization called Minneapolis Angels. So we stemmed from a group called Austin Angels that if you look at, you can see. Uh, and God just really touched that organization by spreading, um, spreading that vision throughout the U.S. Um, our founder, Susan Ramirez, had a heart to open a few chapters um, this year. Yeah, there'll be 22 chapters um, by June. Just a few. <laughs> Yay, <God. laughs> So um, the beauty of that is that we come alongside kids in the foster care system as well as their caregivers to really wrap them with support. And as that child moves placements, we follow the child. Uh, if That's all possible, awesome. So that there's a, a non-paid uh, relationship that exists for that child to support them through to adulthood. <coughs> So <coughs> quickly we do, for younger kids, it's called the Love Box Program, where we monthly commit to, to being in relationship with that child. As that child is a teenager, it's called the Dare to Dream Mentorship Program, where we're one-on-one -on -one mentoring kids to get them to the state when they age out of foster care at 18. They've got the ability to be adults. Yeah. So we're excited to bring that to Minnesota. I am a foster care alum, so I bring that experience as well. I love it. I love it. <coughs> My name is Jacob Strickis, um, and I am an adoptee <coughs> from South Korea. Um, I have a sister that we adopted from Mexico, um, and I serve as an orphan center coordinator for the state of Minnesota, so I get the privilege of chance to reach out to churches, and one of my goals is to just have the knowledge and resources to um, encourage churches mm -hmm. and communities that we can wrap around mm -hmm. these foster and adoptive families. So. Love it. I'm Tiffany Bobbindyer, and I'm a mom of four who all joined our family for adoption, and then also I lead an orphan care adoption ministry at Wisconsin Lutheran Church in Hanover. Okay. Okay. It's been about seven years um, that we've existed, and two years ago we launched a wraparound program, and it was great right away, and then I just I'm going to have a little bit and yep. talk to my fire, so I'm excited. Yeah. In this particular breakout, to kind of just reignite that. Mm -hmm. Get it going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jessie Garcia. Um, I'm a biopositor adoptive mom. Um, a former caseworker with adoption agency, and now I lead our, it's called Rooted, our foster care adoption ministry at Native Christian Center. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Candice. Um, I attended church up there in Cambridge. Yeah, it's been really amazing. So they come to us for a lot of things, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, let's go back. Oh. I'm part of Michelle's church, and so um, 
we want to be, me and my wife want to be supportive of them as well as possibly being interested in adopting ourselves. So. Um, So I, I came a few years ago. I just have three little kids of my own and adopted, and I don't, I love it, but I just like how it's going to be as much as possible. Awesome. Awesome. Michelle, can you talk in video at the same time? Do you want to share with us who you are and why you're standing in the back with the camera <laughs> and the phone? <laughs> I'm Michelle Kulan. I have four kids, um, two biological, two we've adopted through foster care, and um, yeah, I'm the main person for our church for foster adoptive care and um, Kathy's here so that she can take over since <laughs> just kidding <Awesome. laughs> all right I love it okay are you guys ready take a deep breath because I'm gonna fly before I forget okay because remember that we are not gonna be mad I wish we had we could sit here and talk all day and just chat but has anybody heard of this book right here if not it's gold write it down all right, everyone can do something. Jason Johnson is connected with Christian Alliance for Orphans. How many of you are familiar with Christian Alliance for Orphans? Okay, an amazing resource if you are not familiar with CAFO, Google Christian Alliance for Orphans. There are tons of resources on the website. So that will just be, who needs to listen to Cheryl do a workshop when you can go home and sit at your computer and just find kinds of resources. Um, Christian Alliance for Orphans every year has a big, um, conference this year, I believe it's going to be in Kentucky, Louisville, Louisville Kentucky, okay? So highly, highly recommend it. It is a highlight of our year. We see to it that we go over there. There's so much networking, tons of workshops and things. But I just got my hands on this book, and I tell you what, what we are going to do with our church is we're, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about our wraparound at our church, but we're kind of, we kind of went through the season two, right, and we're kind of ramping it up again, and we're going to take some of our leadership through this book. So mm -hmm. highly recommended. A lot of things that maybe I'll allude to today, um, Jason talks about. So one of the primary things that, that I want to mention is that what I heard a lot of you saying is, I am the adoptive and foster mom, and I am the one leading the ministry, <laughs> and I had to kind of take a break. Go figure, right? <laughs> and so... I am that too, okay? I'm an adoptive mom, a foster mom, a pastor's wife, and there are seasons, right, where it's like, you know, I have to take a break for the health of my own family. And so what I have really been challenged on is really building that wraparound support where you all, grandparents, elderly, I hear it was a Kathy, that, you know, those of you that said, you know, God hasn't called me to adopt and foster. And I think one of the things as we my husband and I blow the trumpet in our church. We have a small church of about 300, and I think we've got about 25. I constantly am, you know, families that have adopted that are fostering, and then a pretty big wraparound. Um, so, you know, look what God can do with just one. Just one, and it really started kind of with our story. It really started with my husband, right, saying, God, I was wrong for 18 years not preaching this as leadership. But my point is, you don't have to be the pastor or in leadership. Um, years ago when we were interested in safe families, personally having Maridel come and do a seminar, she said to me, Cheryl, what's really going to be the best, it's a messy ministry. Mm -hmm. And what's going to work the best is when families see it going on. I can come in and talk about it, mm -hmm. but it's not going to have the same impact. So I kid you not, we put it on the back burner, and sometimes the back burner you feel guilty, but the back burner sometimes is God's best, and we don't always see it. About two years later, we get a call randomly one day from Safe Family saying, we've got a mama who is homeless, living in her truck. She's, she's going to be locating to Rice County, which is us, we're in southern Minnesota. Can you help? And so we went, we met this mama at Burger King. We walked in with our two um, girls that were young then. They weren't teenagers yet. We walk in, this mama comes up to me that looked like she could be a teenager herself. And within five minutes, I like you and I like your kids. Will you take my kids? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, who does this? Mm -hmm. Like, it's so foreign to me. Like, who does this? And, of course, I'm thinking, well, no, we can't do this. We're not licensed host families and all of this. Okay, long story short, I could talk a lot about that. But God just fast forward some things because of some of the things that we already had in place. We were able to sign a um, uh, DOPA, Delegation of Power of Attorney. 
And I thought I was off the hook. It was getting close to the holidays, and I wasn't going to have to take these kids in. We'll put you up in a motel, and that'll be great. Nope, the kids ended up in our house. And they ended up being there um, before Christmas. What happened is that night, I got in the house at 4 o'clock, and I got on our fur chain, and I said, I need diapers, I need zipper cups, I need clothes. And within hours, people were dropping things off at our house. Remember, two years prior, you, they got to see it happening. And it empowered. It lit a spark that I couldn't have dreamed up in my own, right? But people were involved. Yes, we took in the kids. We, we, the whole family, minus my husband, got influenza. I have never been so sick in all my life. And I remember too much information sitting in the bathroom, on the toilet, with the bucket. <laughs> going literally talking out loud jesus what have i done to my family you know it's right before christmas and i just looked up in tears and i said i can't do this and it was like i heard jesus say to me you're right <laughs> and that was our journey it was the most horrific <laughs> thing we had ever had but the blessings that come from the messy were incredible and a journey that just continued us on our journey so Children's Opportunity Foundation. In 2005, my husband and I adopted our fourth daughter. We have three bio girls, and we adopted our daughter um, from India. And so we knew that we were going to need to do more than just bring out Shia home. So we um, incorporated a nonprofit. Children's Opportunity Foundation is a faith-based 5-1-C-3 nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to providing advocacy care and training to the at-risk children and families we serve. Originally, we did a lot of work globally with a children's home in India. We still do that, we still lead teams once a year, but God really in the last year and a half has rebranded our organization and we are really seeing the need, specifically in southern Minnesota, to begin working with families that need the help and support. This is part of my plan. So we love our family. You see a little bit of red and yellow, black and white. Our son, um, well, I'll start with the oldest. So this is Melissa, our oldest married to Charlie. Charlie is um, Indian. They are currently serving with back-to-back -back ministries, the schoolers you'll meet. They are living in Hyderabad, India, and um, working on the Children's Hope Campus. They are right now back in Minnesota. Um, and I'll share some more exciting news. That's our oldest. Then we go to Sarah, our redhead, married to Jong. Jong is from South Korea. Um, his parents are missionaries in Bangladesh. Sarah and John uh, currently live in Lakeville. And then we have our Haley, who is 16, and that's our bio plan. And then we have our beautiful Akshaya, who is 15, and we adopted her in 2005 um, from India, Jane and I, and our little Fernando. And our little Fernando right? <laughs> so that's our brood. But the most exciting is we are now Tata and Nani, Grandma and Grandpa, in Hindi. And so um, Melissa and Charlie had Tabitha back in June. Tabitha was born in India, but she is here in the States now. They flew in about two weeks ago, and we are loving, mm. loving, loving our time. It's nothing like the grandma. Better than having your own kid. Great. <laughs> she cries, I give her back to mom and dad. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, the start of your handout. I want to just have us look through, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the passage in Luke, but the feeding of the 5,000. I was recently challenged by this. I thought, oh, I never would have thought of this passage as talking about orphan care. But for those of you that are familiar, in the book of Luke, we see it recorded. One of the things, not depending on your version, but Jesus is asking them the question, what have you got? The disciples were tired. They were ministering. They had came off of all of the healings and all the miracles, and they were part of what Jesus was doing. Jesus himself was discipling them, but they were tired. And all of a sudden, Jesus is like, let them stay. And they're like, send them home. We need the night. There's too many people. How are we going to feed all these people? All the questions are coming, and Jesus is like, what do you got? And we all know the story. What did they have? Well, for 5,000 people, are you kidding me? But Jesus took what was given, he multiplied it, he blessed it, and he used it in a powerful way. Wow, I am loving this story. You know, usually it's James 127, right? But think about it. Think about what all of you are saying. God can do whatever God wants. God doesn't need me. I can't do it. And he's teaching me that in this ministry. But he asked me, what have you got? And my got is going to be different than Colleen's got. And it's okay. Because God has a plan for Colleen 
to do with what she's got, just like he has a plan that I have. I think oftentimes in our churches we're trying to create, Jason talks about this in the book, this, these silo ministries. Okay, where we got the ladies' ministry, we got youth, we got... Have you ever thought about the, your wraparound ministry in your church? Why, do it, why does it have to be a standalone ministry? Why can't we knock down the silos and all come together? Why can't we in our community groups, on a Thursday night when we get together for Bible study, truth story, say, guys, Laura Schultz, the single mama, She's got projects that are stacked up that she can't do. She's got a retaining wall that she got a bid on $8,000, but on eBay she found the blocks for $250, but she needs a skid loader. She needs somebody that knows how to build retaining walls. Hey, Matt, you do that for a living. Would you give up a Saturday? Hey, community group, can we serve together? You guys love hanging out on Thursday nights. How about if we hang out on a Saturday morning and here's what we're going to do? And you know it has been transformational. We have one couple in our community group that's struggling in their marriage. She called me that morning. She said, I'm not coming. Now my husband's not coming. I said, you come. You get your little self over here, and you come. It's changed her. It's changing their marriage. Why? Because they served. They served together. And she saw the benefit, and she is on fire now. They haven't adopted. They haven't fostered, but they're in our community group. And she was one of the first people that called me and said, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to help Laura? And she's a part of it. And I tell those, those couples in our group, I need you more than you'll ever know. Because I'm that adoptive foster mama that needs you. We came off of a really, really hard year of a safe family hosting for two years. The little girl at Child Protection got involved, was going to go into foster care. We had to do a rush licensing, became foster parents. And I love it when I hear counties are, we had a really hard situation with our county, not a good situation. We had to hire an attorney. And so it's been a hard year. And so here I am trying to lead some of this, right? And I'm like, guys, I, I, I can't right now. So I need you. I need you. And, and, I, and I need you personally right now to wrap around me and fill me back up. I often use the example of a styrofoam cup. If it's empty, when we drink water because we're thirsty and we take it in, what happens? It, it runs dry. Is that a bad thing? No, we, gotta, we just got to fill it up again. But until we get it filled up again, we're not going to be able to pour out to those mm -hmm. ministry mm -hmm. too. So I love the example that we find in God's Word. All right, so our goal today is I want each one of you to leave identifying, you know what, I can do something. I can do something. Something. Every one of you can do something. What is your something that you can do? And then visualize my role in a rap ministry. It, it, it might not even be right now in your church. It might be you have a neighbor. I have a neighbor that has fostered and adopted kids. Hey, I can start something right there and then commit to praying that God would show you those next steps. Yeah. All right, a wraparound ministry. So I told you in our church we've been doing it, but we're really kind of coming back and trying to get more structure to it. And so I was thinking about a wraparound ministry, and then we're like, what are we going to call? Or what's our new name going to be? And I'm like, wrap. It's just going to be wrap. So I came up with worship, relationship, available, and prayer. And now I've got to build off of it and bring a leadership group together and see what they think about it. So I Googled rap ministry. <laughs> Guess what? Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so go Google it and see. I changed a few things. Actually, for prayer, I had personal. And I'm like, ah, oh, relationship, available, personal. It's all kind of sounding the same. And they had a prayer on there, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to take one of theirs, and they can take one of mine, and so <laughs> do your research, <laughs> all right? So, First Baptist Church RAP Ministry. RAP is a ministry of First Baptist Church that helps the body of Christ model the Father's heart for the orphan and vulnerable child and those that care for them. It consists of four primary ways that the church can come alongside of our families that have adopted, are fostering, or are working closely with vulnerable children. That, that is going to be our mission statement. Oftentimes, in church, people don't know what they don't know. And if we're not telling them, I am kind of that visionary. I'm out there. If you say, hey, here's a need, my personality is I'm going to figure out how to make it work. But I realize not everybody's wired that way. So I might look at somebody, and they're looking at me with deer in the headlights like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, really? Seriously, just figure something out. But we don't know what we don't know. You might be surrounded by people that you're kind of going, man, I just don't get it. Like, they don't 
want to do anything. The bottom line is they probably do, they just have no clue where to start. And so what was that word we used? Like push up, bring them in, take them out for coffee, share your story, begin to let them have a vision of what you're talking about. And oftentimes if you're in a church where you're working, Jason talks in his book, top up where the leadership is on board and everything is flowing from them, or your situation bottom up, bottom up, watch, let them watch it happen. It's kind of like what I'm learning going to our counties. They have a lot of well-intended people that are banging at their door saying, we got this. They want to see it. They want to see the proof. So I'm not going to get discouraged if they're doing this right now, but when they start seeing, there's this church in Waterville, a town of 1,800, that has 25 families that have adopted, that are doing foster care, that people are reaching out. These kids are changing like, hmm, tell me a little more about this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my focus on helping those families stay strong so that we can be that light. Instead of banging doors that I'm banging my head going, this isn't working, this isn't working. And sometimes it's seasons. God's had to teach me, you know, my, my plan when we started a year ago bringing uh, David and Jane Schooler into Minnesota that I was going to have the trauma competent care training for all these case workers. And I quickly realized, you know what, that's not going to happen. It's okay. Let's gather individuals who have a heart and a passion and are going to do this. Colleen and Laura and others were there. There was about 25 of us. It was amazing. I'm excited what God's going to do with those individuals as they go out. All right, so worship, a team, a team, a team, a team. That is what I am learning is that we have to have a team. So before you even begin to try to do that ministry, how many of you just started doing it? I did. Okay, it's not, it's not always wrong, but I think I realized I need a team. So I got to backtrack. I got a disciple. I got to gather a team. So in our wrap, um, we, Children's Opportunity We, has networked with an organization called Project 127. How many of you are familiar with Project 127? Write them down again, all right? So if you notice on Facebook, they just announced um, that Children's <coughs> Opportunity is in Minnesota, and we are networking with them. A great organization. One of the things that they do when they train their adoptive and foster families is they have a four-hour training, and these families have to identify 12 people. That sounds crazy, right? Now, even as I'm showing you this, we are still in the works because you're going to see in every category a team of three or four, a team of three or four. Where am I going to find 12 people that are going to do this? But you know what? God's got this. Everybody can do something. And so then they bring that team of 12 in for four hours of training. Because oftentimes what happens is we had people say to us when we were fostering our little girl, Bring her over for a night. You guys just go out. Do you know how badly Jean and I just wanted to go out on a date? But what's, what's the practicality of it? Can I take a traumatized kiddo who's going to trigger into a home that isn't even, I can't do it. So then I'm discouraged. These people are like, well, I, what are we going to do? So we got to get creative. And one of the things that we're going to start doing is we're going to sit down and kneecap to kneecap and say, you're the adopted mama. What do you need and what does it look like? Her needs are not going to be your needs. His needs are not going to be your needs. Now, what happens when you're running a ministry when you've got 16 different needs? Ah, right? But then what do we do? We disciple, we reach out. Hey, community group, Laura's in your group. Can you make a meal? She told me that she just needs somebody to take down the trash on Friday morning. And all of a sudden, we're bringing everybody in. Youth group, she needs projects done. She needs her yard raked. Will you do it? But we need a team, and we need to know what each family needs. And I think I love the toolkits that are out there. You know, I've done them, I have them, we work them, but I'm kind of going, ah, the toolkits really all sound great. And even this sheet that you got, you know, that's part of the toolkit. Did I? We didn't maybe have these off, so really grab one if you want one. This is a great um, visual that Project 127 has put together. Here's some things you can do, but it's going to look different. And I think for those of you that have been doing wraparound long enough, you're probably resonating going, yeah, everything that sounds good. They need meals. They need babysitting. They need diapers. They need, and all of a sudden you're going, can I really, 
it's kind of like overrated. It's not really working right. Anybody are you resonating with me? Like, okay, so then what do we have to do to make it work a little bit better? So the worship part. One of the things that this is going to be developed is my heart is to be able to create an atmosphere for our families that they understand orphan care, adoption, foster care, and abortion. And it's hard. And it stinks really bad some days. We could all sit here and tell stories, right? And, and I'm the adoptive foster mom going through that stink, and I am asking God, God, you have never, this last year, I had to watch my little girl go through something that was so horrific that my worst nightmare of what could happen to a child happened, and I'm in the middle of it, and I can't do anything. Talk about rocking my theology. I'm the pastor's wife, guys. I shouldn't let that rock me, but you know what? I realize how strong my theology of who God is. God, why? You could have stopped this. Absolutely, Cheryl, but who am I? I am God. And so it made me, my hard, hard experience made me realize I need a community of people that are going to worship. Yeah, I need that one that I can just talk, call, and vent. I need that friend who I can just say, why is God letting this happen? But I need that person who is going to lead me into worship of who the living God really is and say, Cheryl, come back. Who is God? And I think for us personally, I'm going to be honest, I think that component has been missing. And if we miss this and do all of the other stuff, it's going to fall by the wayside. Because when that hard comes and it rocked my theology, I have to have this. That ultimately God is sovereign and he is writing a story that I don't understand, but he's there. And I need people in my life that are going to pour into the aspect of worship. I think it's number one. Prayer, a team of three or four people who will commit to praying, sharing scriptural encouragement through notes, emails, um, phone calls, etc. And whatever that's going to look like, you set up that prayer team. Relationship, this is key to that ongoing mentoring relationship. It has been so hard. Our little girl is back home now with her mama, but I had built a relationship with her for two years before foster care entered. County worker, guardian at light, um, they, didn't, they didn't get this weird relationship that was going on with now foster mom and birth mom. Well, do you know she's doing this and this and this and this? Mm -hmm. And are we enabling, are we doing that? And I would stick my gun and I would stand up there and I'm like, I'm going to be her advocate. You better believe I'm not going to excuse the things she's doing, but do we really think that she needs me to be saying how awful she is right now? She hears it from everybody else. I don't need to be that one. She's the only person right now that she has told me after it took me two years before her before I heard her say, You are the only people I can trust. Why did it happen that way? She gave her most precious possession to my husband and I and our family to care for. And she loved her little girl like nobody's business. And God had to change my heart. I tell you what, I was all about these bio parents and look what they're doing to these kids. Bring me the kids. What about these mamas? They love their kids. They're trying. She screamed out to the county for two years and they wouldn't listen. And she got into stuff that she shouldn't have by her own testimony. And then they're putting her in, you know, treatments and things like this. 30 days. Who's going to come out after 30 days and be healed and well? This is going to be a lifetime. And our little girl now, I love what you're doing because it's been hard. We're, st we're not going anywhere. In our last court appearance, and when our when our um, attorney had to come in to fight for us to gain party status because we realized foster parents had no rights, we stood before that judge and we said, "We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. You're gonna get tired of us. But we're not going anywhere. We're gonna be in this little girl's life because other people have done that for us, and that's what she's gonna need. And she has got a safe place where she can come. We just had her last weekend, and her mama is now coming to church on Sundays, and these kids have found a safe place." It breaks my heart that they live, in, they live in a town they have to drive 30 miles because they've tried other churches, but the other churches don't welcome them. They're the, bad, they're the bad kids. But it's okay at our church if the kids run in right before Jean has to go up and preach the message, and she's getting her hug. My husband is the only daddy that she knows right now. But she's safe. And her mama is safe now. And 
Mm. Wow. Mm. It's Jesus, right, guys? It's yeah. Jesus that's changing this family. The story's not over, but I tell you what, it's not gonna it's it's gonna be a long haul. Mm. And when you're dealing with mental illness, it's hard. Mm. And every story looks a little different. Not always are you gonna be able to have that. So I love what you guys are doing. That is just the coolest. Available. A team of three or four people who will make themselves available to meet the specific needs laid out by the families they are serving. It might mean providing a meal. I think that available piece is going to be a little bit more, you know, not in-depth that relationship. It's just being available to provide a meal, whatever it is that the family needs. All right. Do you all care if we take an extra five minutes off of your break time? Please do. Here's what I want you to do. Circle up. And I don't know how you want to do it. I'm going to let you all do it. But I want, I have two case studies in your notes, okay? So I want you all to do a little bit of practice on how we're going to do this. How can you as a church, how can I do this? How can we now wrap around this family? So just circle up a little bit. Somebody read the case study. And I'll tell you, we're not going to have a lot of time in about three minutes. I want you to come up with some ideas of how you're going to help this family. So why don't we say this side is case study one, this side is case study two. Make sense? All right.
big one that I just heard this this weekend even with our training is I I can't get out like my church office my church in their wraparound ministry offers a free babysitting and my kids will come but then I deal with the anxiety that puts them through for the next day so the bottom line is I can't do that kind of stuff so I can't leave my children so what we're trying to figure out at our church is we need a safe place where the parents can come and then we're going to do some of the trauma constant care training with the parents while the kids are in a nurture group, that we learn nurture groups, where they're getting the principles, they're with other kiddos that get that, and they're being worked with, and we're integrating some of the principles, how's your engine running, we're doing it in our Sunday school and our team of kids, so it's, it's language that the kids are just 
all the kids are doing it, so it's not weird and awkward. But now we're providing, and how many times, let's face it guys, to think about, I can't do a training because I can't provide the kind of necessary child care that these kids need. There's been Sundays where I had to stay home with our little girl because I knew the Sunday school teacher was down on their home, and I knew our little girl would run out of the classroom, and the teacher wasn't available to be there. I had to stay home. It's huge. It's, I don't mind what overwhelming you because you're all going, and then what happens is you just want to do it. Okay? So love it. Great. Other ideas? All right, I don't want to keep you away from getting some coffee. If you have other questions, you guys, so good. I would encourage you um, at the table when you came in, the, the workshop speakers have some stuff. We have, I have a business card there. Um, you'll see our little thing that says Children's Opportunity Foundation. Grab my card. If we can be of any other help, I hope I gave you some in the short amount of time. I have some good ideas. I'd love to network. You know, if it means, hey, we're, we're putting a leadership together, team together, can we get together and get some coffee and figure stuff out together? Sometimes we all need that too, right? When you're in this line of work, you need your own team to wrap around you. So let me pray for all of you. Can I do that? Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this conference today and the work that Michelle and her team did putting it together. I thank you for each one of these dear brothers and sisters that are here in this room. God, this is a hard, hard job that you've called us to. So would you just refresh everyone that's here today, encourage their hearts, let them find their identity in you, Jesus, and give them the answers. And would you remind every one of us that you're just saying, you have something, what are you going to do with it? And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to bless it. Thank you for that promise, Jesus, that we have in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great meeting.